Hi everyone, and welcome back to The Wheelchair Activist. This is a podcast hosted by me, Emma Vogelman, where I interview some pretty amazing disabled people and some amazing allies of the disabled community. Today, I am introducing the amazing Liam O'Dell. Liam is an incredible deaf journalist and campaigner, and you probably already know him from his amazing social media presence. I'm so excited to jump in to today's conversation with Liam. The fact that my autism means that I take a more kind of literal but um, logical and creative approach to the world is is wonderful. It means that I think outside the box in comparison to um, non-disabled peers. So it's wonderful. There's there's some people for whom free speech isn't isn't necessarily um, free speech as the UN Declaration on Human Rights would define it, but rather a free speech where it's freedom to say what you think without consequence. I mean, even right now, I'm seeing instances where people are, are, you know, flooding either my mentions or the mentions of other people with horrific ableist and eugenicist and discriminatory things, but Twitter is still failing to act upon them. Lovely. Oh, Liam, thank you so much for joining me on The Wheelchair Activist. It's um, such a pleasure to have you on. I feel like people will absolutely know your name from social media, but it would be wonderful if you could tell our audience a little bit about you and what you do. Of course. Uh, Thank you very much for having me on. So I... I'm flattered that most people will know who I am. I don't. I, I, I don't know about that, but that's that's very kind of you to say. Um, but for those who maybe don't know who I am, uh, I'm Liam Liam O'Dell. Uh, I'm 25 and a freelance journalist and campaigner. So, I my kind of typical role in the disability space is quite a nice combination of reporting, specifically around deafness, but it has. It has and does and will continue to um, span other disabilities as well. I've been doing a lot of reporting on autism at the moment as well. Um, And so there's that one side of it. And then the other side is more of the campaigning side. So I myself am deaf, dyspraxic, uh, autistic, and I have obsessive compulsive disorder as well. And my platforms that I've built up over the years so a blog and obviously the usual social media channels that we all have twitter instagram facebook have become places where i can hopefully share a bit of knowledge and insight into what uh what the life of a disabled person is like and the kind of um faux pas that can happen and the what needs to be done and what needs to be in place for disabled people to be truly included in society and for uh for well to fit for them to also feel like um all of the barriers in place are no longer there or are being worked upon and that includes attitudes as well so i mm-hmm. i hope to i hope it's a big ask and I, i'm by no means there but i don't think i ever will be there because there'll always be work to do but uh, yeah, my, my platform, whether through journalism or campaigning, has always been to hopefully change attitudes and uh, get people thinking because I, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of big conversations and big discussions myself. And hopefully through my work, I like to inspire that in others. Amazing. And I feel that you are the first guest who, when I ask this big question to you, won't think it's a mean, big question then. I very much hope. Um, but I want to ask you the question that I ask all of my guests is what does disability mean to you? Um, wow. Uh, <laughs> a big question. Um, I, I think so. I, I subscribe, first of all, to the social model of disability. So that means that I, I see myself as disabled 
not by the conditions that I have, but rather the attitudes and infrastructure in society around me. So, for example, I'm not um, I'm not disabled in terms of my deafness um, most of the time until the environment is too noisy or there aren't subtitle screenings or people are not being clear in how they communicate, for example. So disability to me means that means that I, I am disabled by the, um, the environment around me more than anything. But I do also think in a more specific sense, in my case, um, disability is um, a way in which I interact with the world and navigate the world differently. Um, and that isn't just in the case of, um, of the way in which um, we have to adapt around our, our, uh, our conditions. So obviously for, for deaf people, um, me to an extent, sign language might be a way in which you navigate conversations. But I think as in, alongside that, um, it makes you see the world differently because you because ableism and negative attitudes and prejudices kind of force you to to uh, to navigate the world differently as well. It's, it's 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 kind of two sides to that. One of them is actually the elements of your of your own condition, um, but the other is also the attitudes that society uh, gives you on a regular basis. Unfortunately, some of them not always positive, and that kind of forces you um yeah it can force you to mature a little bit um it, it it can um it can be quite traumatic but it can also be quite um tough to have to constantly advocate for yourself and constantly push for yourself and your own needs to be met um because the way in which that that's done on such a regular basis it does kind of perhaps mature you more uh, more quickly than someone who is non-disabled because you're having to build up this resilience and build up this um, this mindset and approach to to society which um, privileged non-disabled people don't have to worry about as much uh, if at all um, so yeah that's a very long-winded answer again but uh yeah, I think I think dis disability means to me that it's attitudes and infrastructure which disable me, but also it means that I navigate the world in a new, uh, different uh, and ex exciting way. Um, so I know I kind of talked about the negatives there, but there are, the fact that my autism means that I take a more kind of literal but um, logical and creative approach to the world is is wonderful it means that I think outside the box in comparison to um, non-disabled peers so it's wonderful is one is is, is 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 if you want to cut all of that down you could just end it with yeah. it's wonderful that is, that is that is disability in my eyes I think that's so valid though because there there are struggles there are challenges that we face every day whether that's physical barriers or digital or like you said with other people's attitudes and those are very difficult but there are as you quite rightly say a lot of positives towards disability and just as you were talking about that need to possibly mature earlier than your non-disabled peers I completely agree with that I think it not only do you need to build up resilience, but also the self-awareness of what your needs are and what could meet those needs. But, you know, as you also said about being a creative thinker, I think disabled people can often be the best creative problem solvers because there aren't obvious solutions to a lot of the problems that we face every day. So, we have to come up with them on our own. And I suppose, yeah, I just does that does that sort of resonate with you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the whole idea, the whole idea of um kind of 
maturing, and maturing was actually something that just came into came to my head earlier today when someone very kindly said I I I um I had a bit of maturity that was beyond my years or something like that. Um, but you're right about creativity as well. Like I think it's it is interesting because if you ask me about a lot of other different things, oh, sorry, if you ask me about um, spontaneity in most environments, it can still throw me off kilter. Uh, I mean, as an autistic person, the the idea of sudden change can really throw me off. But interestingly, I'm finding there's kind of two instances uh, in everyday life that, that have really enabled me to actually just manage that just fine. One of them is journalism, um, because that's my career. And also, um, I've kind of become acclimatized to the fact that journalism is very much an industry where things can and will and do um, change quite often at the drop of a hat. Um, and the say the second one is is more, as you say, about kind of everyday everyday environments where things change and you have to adapt to individuals, whether they um, in my case, whether they have different accents, whether they have um, different mannerisms in terms of how they communicate. Um, there, there are a lot of different factors in, in everyday life that we that we have to uh, we have to allow for, and that's that's kind of the the unpredictability of everyday life. Like I, I imagine a few um, non-disabled people listening in might be going, "Well, isn't isn't that just life in general? Life is just unpredictable and wonderful and completely um, impossible to." to uh to navigate with any certainty and and that that you're right um but i think when you add disability into the mix there's um there's a whole new level of um variance to it that that is that is that is interesting and you're right in terms of having to navigate that it can encourage creativity um and i think that then that then um feeds quite nicely into the way in which we all advocate for these things. You know, the, the creative spark that um, we have to foster around navigating barriers is um, a similar creative spark that then could be implemented in creative works that we, we want to pursue, whether that be podcasts like this, whether that be infographics on Instagram, whether it be books, um, or whatever resources you want to put out there, it it kind of it kind of blends quite nicely uh, that creativity from the creativity that we require and need and have to develop in in our everyday lives, as you say. Mm. And there, I mean, there are a few things in there that I want to come back to, but I want to ask, where did journalism start for you as a career? Where did the what what moment did you think this is what I want to do? So ever since I was a child, I always had my head in the book. I, I just loved reading. I connected with it instantly. Um, well, I don't know about instantly. I can't really remember that far back. But um, it, 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 was, it was certainly from from a very, very young age that I that I just fell in love with with words and English and uh, vocabulary and all of the kind of things associated with language. Um, and so I, I soon decided that alongside the books I was reading, I wanted to try and write some myself. They never, unfortunately, got anywhere. I'd write a couple of chapters and then lose confidence in myself. But I knew that I wanted to write a book um, and that I wanted to uh, make writing in some sense a career. Um, and so that was kind of ticking away in the back of my mind um, until like the inevitable conversations kick in at middle uh, in secondary school. I've said middle, middle school. It was more upper school, actually. We do things differently here in Bedfordshire in terms of the education system. Um, but it was around that point in secondary school where they start asking you about what you want to do, what sort of qualifications you want to take like further down the line to kind of gear you in the career that you want to go uh, you want to pursue um and i remember this clear as day because i owe so much to the careers advisor that that um that advised me but they were saying well okay 
Um, because at that point, I I realised that journal uh, that becoming an author wouldn't necessarily be the most financially stable thing to do if it means that I have to send over manuscripts to agents, wait patiently for uh, for weeks, if not months, uh, and expect to hear something back. That's not going to be sustainable, and that's not really bringing me any income. So the next logical step was was journalism because it kind of combined. Um, my love of writing, creative writing, and also just um, speaking to people and learning new things. It all kind of combined all of my main interests. Um, and so with that, going back to the careers advisor, they, I said that I'd like to, to look into that as a career. And the first thing they recommended, or one of the things they recommended was um, setting up a blog, which I, I did in 2012. So it's coming up to 10 years now. Um, and that that really worked wonders for really opening up doors for me. Um, I, at the time, was really struggling to write opinion pieces. My blog became an outlet for me to, to really develop that. And it, it's nice because it's now a point where, the uh, and it has always been, the blog's kind of a, a um, training ground for whatever writing styles I need to work on or improve. Um, to the point where I can perfect them uh, and then pitch those to other outlets. So I now am very fortunate to have written opinion pieces for um, outlets such as Metro.co.uk, The Independent, uh, I'm trying to think of some more, The Guardian. Um, they that, that blog I owe so much to, uh, and especially that careers advisor that advised I set one up. Um, and then, yeah, that's that kind of came about. And then not long after that, uh, I got involved in a youth group with the National Deaf Children's Society, uh, their youth advisory board. Uh, and during that time, I was made aware of a blog called The Limping Chicken, which is specifically dedicated to deaf news. Started writing for them uh, a bit more regularly. Uh, and then went to university, pursued the degree and got the journalism degree that I needed. Uh, and it took a little while after, after graduating in 2018 to find uh, my foot in or find my feet in journalism. But come 2020, my, uh, a real freelance journalism career uh, took off, which I am still very lucky to have now. And it's it's been a lovely balance of freelance work and freelance commissions and opportunities that come through. Uh, into my email inbox and the more paid shift type work, which is with outlets such as the independent metro.co.uk, uh, Indy 100. Uh, and uh, oh, no, I think those are, those are the main ones at the moment, but uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's been, it's been uh, a, a, a wild ride for sure, but it was just, yeah, in terms of why I went down that route, I think it was always just because I, I really enjoyed the creative aspect. I loved the fact, and whenever I um, whenever I have job interviews about this or whenever I have to explain why I like journalism to people, it's the fact that in the space of even as short as 24 hours, if even less, um, you have to become an expert in a subject. Uh, you have to become an expert in a subject so that you can understand the subject that you can ask the right questions about a subject to the people that know more about it than you might, then you need to know enough about it so that you can translate those questions or kind of contextualise those questions in a wider news report uh, and make it accessible to people who read it. So it's there's a lot of different elements of journalism that are just absolutely thrilling and fascinating to me. And it just, yeah, it combines so much of what I love and enjoy. So it's been wonderful that I've been, and I'm, I'm very appreciative and privileged to be able to say that that is now a career that I am now in, which I'm, I'm very grateful for. And there are moments where I still have to pinch myself. I think it's so wonderful, though, that your careers advisor gave you that idea because I, it, my role at the moment, which is working in children and young people policy at, at Scope, I hear so, so often about career advisors not adequately advising 
young disabled people on careers options or what they might be interested in and therefore sort of limiting the ambitions of young disabled people. So I'm I'm so pleased to hear about a good example of that. Yeah, and, and to be to be absolutely clear, um I've I have always been aware of the fact that throughout education, I've been so, so, so lucky um with the support that I had at my school, with learning support, um kind of teachers that were um kind of having regular meetings with me to check in that I was okay and that I was managing with with lessons and everything. I know not everyone had that had that access, but also um on the point about careers advisors and, and work, I know the National Deaf Children's Society is is doing a big campaign at the moment around um I think called Deaf Works Everywhere that's really about the careers advice that is given to deaf young people. Because yeah, I think it, you touched the, you touched upon it a little bit. There is still this um, there is still this mindset in in some careers advice. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily know about the current climate because I'm I'm kind of outside the um, outside the wage where I I benefit from careers advice now because I've, I've I've got the career I want. But um, I know I've I've heard at least that there is still this mindset or approach where it's a case of in relation to disability what a disabled person can't do before it's what they can do um and it's kind of they they have to kind of navigate the um jobs market through this very uh negative and uh restrictive view of well uh, of can't do rather than can do or even would like to do um because you know I, I i'm one of those people that thinks with the right support um deaf people can do oh sorry deaf people but also disabled people more widely deaf and disabled people with the right support can do anything that they would like to do uh, and 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 would want to put their mind towards and that includes careers um, so no, that's that's just something I wanted to mention on that point because I, I I agree that careers advice definitely could be better in that respect. There's something I wanted to ask you about that you touched on earlier about sort of the difficulty that I think a lot of people, but you mentioned specifically you would struggle with a sort of constantly changing environment or constantly changing circumstances. So. And as you say, journalism is one of those occupations where things change very, very quickly. So how do you reconcile that? Because I think what is really interesting to me is that um, there can be these ideas of what a career looks like. And I think when you have certain disabilities, you can think, oh, well, I definitely can't do that because I would struggle with this, this, and this, but you've made that work. So how how has that been for you? That's a really good question. Um, so I I think, I, I, I if, if you ever ask me to put a finger on why uh, I managed to, to get by in journalism without <laughs> completely... Um, completely breaking down I suppose um I think I think a lot of it comes down to organization there is and also just routine I think as well um because journalism just by nature is often very much very robotic in the sense that you have to you have a kind of typical structure to a news report that you have to follow which begins with the who what where when why um, kind of further information about the situation and then a quote or two and then kind of beef up the story a bit more until you finish it with, you can find more information here. There is kind of a typical structure that you follow with a news story and then, and, and then as an extension of that, there are typical um, procedures that you have to follow with each story, Get the, go to this person for a quote, go to that um place for a quote speak to that person for a statement um and so with all of that in in place um 
there, there's still a lot of stability um, that, that journalism is based around. Where the unpredictability comes in is often around um, chasing interviewees and chasing contacts. And that, that requires more of a um, persistence and uh, determination to, to get the answers. And that still kind of comes from an approach of organization um, and kind of planning, um, because journalism requires a lot of planning. And it's, and again, it's, you can kind of find ways in which journalism and the routines and methods it requires can be adapted to suiting you. I'm quite lucky that a lot of the basic journalistic procedures like how to write a story, how to approach people people for comment statements, that sort of thing. Um, they are quite they're quite straightforward in my eyes at least. And so, or to me at least, I, I appreciate they might not be for everyone. Um, but the, the benefit of that is that is that it, there's there's little that is um, unpredictable. I, I feel like I'm going off a tangent here and lost my original point, but I, <laughs> which happens a lot. Um, but no, I think I think there's there is a certain amount of self control that you can practice in journalism, which will enable you to nav- navigate the more unpredictable parts. Um, because if you if you're able to manage and control as much of that career or as that uh, of that role or that position as you can then the bits that are less predictable and more unpredictable, you kind of have more headspace, brain space, capacity to deal with that. If everything was completely overwhelming and everything was so uh, breakneck speed, so intense, then you you wouldn't know where to begin. But I think the fact that, that a lot of journalism that I do appeals to my love of planning, structure, organization, routine, it means that I, that kind of the brain space that I would otherwise be spending trying to uh, unpack all of that is, is now that kind of brain space that I can keep in reserves for when things don't quite go to plan mm. or when things are a little bit more touch and go. I think that's so interesting that in pursuing what you want to do you found almost a method to follow to make sure that you're covering all of the basics and the fundamentals of journalism and making it into something that can really work well and I think that that's really really important and the another thing I wanted to ask you about is a little bit around representation and disability because in addition to all of your journalism work that you do you set up the disabled community group on twitter and you've done a lot around make trying to advocate for disabled people to be verified on twitter as well which for people who don't know is that little blue tick next to um someone's name which sort of proves to you know, other people that they are who they say they are, and it's been verified by Twitter. But I wanted to ask you about that piece of work and sort of why it was important and where you see it going. Um, so there's kind of two parts to that question, uh, the community and the verified disabled Twitter campaign. Um, so I'll start with the community. I think I've always enjoyed Twitter. Uh, I know other people may describe it as a hellscape, but I owe so much to that platform for bringing me uh, in contact with other disabled people. Um, The idea for that really was just, oh, this is a nice shiny new feature on Twitter. I wonder what that's about. That was one, (laughs) that was one thing that came to my mind, but also the fact that um, it seemed to be more than just a hashtag uh, or seem to be more than just like one simple community that can be bonded over um, a simple phrase or a simple uh, trending topic. Um, And so I thought with that in mind, if it is just more, if it is more of a wider collective thing, um, 
why not have a disability community that means that we aren't that the conversations that we're having aren't just kind of spread out across the Twitterverse, if you like, with different hashtags, you know, hashtag stop spectrum 10k for the autistic community, uh, hashtag deaf Twitter for um, for the deaf community and so on. I'm not denying or saying that those hashtags shouldn't exist, but what I thought with the community, which could be really good, and I'm seeing that somewhat, is that all of those strands could be could exist in their own right, but also be housed under this one kind of community forum, um, such as the uh, disability Twitter community. And so I set that up with kind of a place for solidarity and to share like jokes and uh, um, and kind of light-hearted content, but also as a place for um, shared campaigning to draw attention to issues and to seek support. Um, and we've, and it's it's been I don't know when it started. I think it was a good couple of months ago now, maybe at the start of the year that I set it up. And it's already proven to be a really positive space for people to get advice about specific conditions and disabilities, to um, discussing current events, to uh, a whole range of um, kind of individual requests for support. And it's, it's lovely to see that um, because I think, um, well, we, you know, it, it kind of underscores the, the basic argument that together we are stronger and definitely in the terms of disability community having uh having a real place that can demonstrate people uniting and coming together is is wonderful so that's that's the uh the community and um, i hopefully will go from strength to strength as twitter puts more work into the feature and i figure out more about what i'm supposed to be doing um but as for the verified disabled twitter campaign um that came about through conversations with myself and um between myself and uh, another advocate called poppy field who is wonderful um and we were just kind of noticing the distinct lack of disabled people being verified and recognized for their advocacy on twitter um and so, so you would see like a lot of celebrities, mainstream celebrities, non-disabled celebrities, um, kind of other personalities getting the blue tick, especially after Twitter unveiled its new verification policy uh, sometime last year, I believe. Um, but the, the number of disabled people that were getting blue ticks, getting verified and having that kind of elevation that comes with, with, with being verified was, was so few, so little. Um, and so I decided to set up that hashtag verified disabled Twitter, but also um, maintain a list of all of the um, activists that would apply for verification only to be rejected. And some of these people um, absolutely deserve to to be verified and to have that, that visibility. I'm talking names like Dr. Amy Kavanagh, who is just phenomenal uh, as a campaigner and activist and has made lots of media appearances. Same with Dr. Hannah Barham Brown, who is the deputy leader of a UK political party. So why she hasn't been verified, I don't know. Um, and there's a, and you know, there's other broadcasters, writers, um, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of other examples, but the you know people that are really prominent in our community, but also have kind of branched out into the wider non-disabled community, and that you know people outside of our own community know who they are and the, the valuable work that they that they are doing, um, and yet they're not getting these these blue ticks. And so, I really wanted to shine a light on that, and and kind of as a result of digging deep into that there were a whole load of different things I was able to find out namely and it remains the case that um the accounts in order to apply for verification under the activist category have to have at least 100,000 followers which is absolutely ludicrous when you talk when you talk about the fact that a lot of disabled activists by being a member of a marginalized community 
do not have a hundred thousand followers and you know probably it would take them a long time to get anywhere near that figure so i've really kind of been constantly um here, here and there now because um there hasn't been many updates for verification but regular opportunities just kind of really calling upon twitter to lower that um lower that threshold or find alternatives for recognizing um marginalized uh creators in the disability community and final point on that is that i've seen a few people since campaigning about it asking well it's a blue tick it's verification what really um what really comes out of that what's what's so important that you need to have a blue tick but i think about the fact that that with that comes more visibility um a blue tick often means that you are more likely to appear in the top search results on Twitter. Um, so there's more visibility, there's the opportunity for more work. Um, and the and I won't lie, when I since I got verified, um, and to be clear, that doesn't affect whether or not I still continue to champion verifying other disabled people, I will still do that because it's an injustice across the board. It, you know, my my verification has no impact on that. Um, but um, the, yeah, the, the, I've lost my train of thought, but I, I think it's, um, yeah, the, you know, people will say, well, why is it necessary? But I've noticed that since I had it, my follow count has been going up and the opportunities have been going up and the visibility has been going up. And all of those things are incredible things for a community um that uh can face challenges with securing income um and can face difficulty with um visibility but also it, it can also have an impact in terms of impersonation um disabled people like like a lot of high profile people on that platform can be impersonated interestingly impersonation isn't actually a factor that determines whether or not you get verified, which is a bit silly. Um, but I know in my case, for example, um, I called out, um, I, called, I, I did a post about, um, it, was, it was a tongue in cheek post admittedly, but it was about um, Sia uh, and all the controversy that surrounded her in the, uh, the ableist film that she made. And some of her supporters weren't, weren't so keen on that. And I was impersonated. Um, and that obviously has huge reputational damage, not least if we were already marginalised and trying to build a, a reputation for ourselves. The last thing that we need is someone to damage that by impersonating us. So there's a whole range of different reasons why verification is important. And I've really kind of just been championing that and calling on Twitter to really um, sort it out. And uh, I will continue to, to do that until, until Twitter gets its uh, gets its act together which unfortunately in that respect it, it, it isn't quite there yet i think it's also really important when we talk about verification on twitter and you really quite rightly say that it isn't just about that little blue tick but i think particularly now when disabled people are not so yes we are a marginalized group we do face systematic discrimination and all of that but particularly in the past two and a bit years during the pandemic where we're being continually ignored forgotten and then gaslit by our own government in terms of you know the fears the very real fears that we have around covid and the lockdowns and all of those things that it's really important for social media platforms to be doing what they can to not just amplify our voices, but verify that we are here and that we are a presence. And it's, I think, also really important because social media is such a vital tool for so many disabled people. You know, if forget you and me, for example, who have a huge amount of our career on social media, but for that connection between people with you know if when you have a 
disability and for so many reasons if you may struggle to get out and about and meet people in the physical sense the virtual space is crucial for us so to not be silenced or quieted i suppose is one way of putting it on social media by not verifying us is is damaging i think absolutely yeah absolutely i i I don't really have much else to add to that because you've 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 summarized it perfectly and perhaps in far fewer words than (laughs) myself i tried to do um a few minutes ago um but yeah no absolutely and uh it's yeah it's it's it, it's just it just gives greater meaning to people putting their advocacy out into the world to know that it's it's validated it is um is recognized and Twitter thinks it has weight um because yeah as you know and you, you kind of touched upon it there you know it's also about it's also about information um and uh kind of well to an extent i imagine facts fact checking and really kind of presenting a wider view on current affairs as well which i know twitter's kind of whether it chose to or or otherwise it's kind of become in the sense of it's it's almost now like a news reporting tool um more than anything and if we are to if twitter is really to kind of develop on that even even if it isn't their original intention, then one way it needs to do that is is really ensure that um, sources from different communities are, are platformed. And we're, we're being cut out of that conversation by only having a handful of um, disability activists that have got the blue tick. I have a question that has only just occurred to me, and it, it might be very unfair putting you on the spot because it's so recent but elon musk is known to be on the autistic spectrum i don't personally know if he's done anything necessarily around disability but what impact do you think and then what impact do you hope him being the owner whatever of twitter will have on the disabled community on the platform Gosh, I I haven't really given it much thought. Um, I don't know whether that's partly because I am terrified about the concept of one billionaire having control of a major social media platform, and I've just kind of tried to block it out of my head. Otherwise, I, I will just yeah. break down in tears. Um, but um, yeah, I I I know other people of uh, in the community have, have really kind of demonstrated the impact that it can have and i think i i I do worry that his kind of um from the sound of things his pursuit of free speech and kind of really lean into that side of things is a problem um because I, i i get the sense that when some people mostly those on the more white wing of the uh, of the political spectrum either here in the us uh, sorry here in the uk or across the pond in the us there's there's some people for whom free speech isn't isn't necessarily um free speech as the un declaration on human rights would define it but rather a free speech where it's freedom to say what you think without consequence um and to bring that to disability or to kind of bring that back to disability, what I think is so concerning about that is that, um, you know, there's talk about whether or not Donald Trump will come back to the platform, whether there's kind of other white wing uh, individuals that, um, that will return to Twitter and target minorities um, because those on the very far right of the political spectrum or those that are um very vocal about it tend to target minorities Mm. um and if if we want if if there's going to be a platform under elon musk um where free speech uh controls are relaxed um or um lifted in a way in which free speech is, is is less 
um, less restrained, I do worry that we might see more um, abuse on the on the platform because the 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 rules are so relaxed. I mean, even right now, I'm seeing instances where people are, are you know flooding either my mentions or the mentions of other people with horrific ableist and eugenicist and discriminatory things but twitter is still failing to act upon them um and if that's the case now before elon musk potentially takes over the platform i do genuinely fear about what that means for abuse on the platform mm. um when if when musk takes over um and, and pursues this whole kind of free speech approach um i think that's that's how i certainly see it i do worry that um and then that kind of puts disabled people in a really difficult position because do they if 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 as i prophesize um the the online space on twitter becomes far more toxic because the restraints on abusive uh, content is more lax, then that disabled people have a balance because it's do mm. you stay on a platform that has afforded you a wonderful online community that, that offers solidarity, offers advice, offers support, um, if doing so means that you're also being bombarded with um, abuse and um kind of vitriol that is really quite unpleasant. Um, it's, it's a difficult balance to strike. You know, I don't think, and you know, like you said earlier, there's, there's people for whom the online community is the only way in which they can connect with other, other people and even other disabled people. So if they then are faced with the ultimatum of, um, you know, staying on a platform at the, ex uh, at the expense or uh, while at the same time dealing with a barrage of abuse, they face a completely uh, uh, challenging and distressing decision to make about what exactly they do. Um, and so, yeah, I, 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 and also just in general, um, placing too much power in the hands of, of one individual at the top of a social media company is just never a good idea, irrespective of the nuances of disability. I just think in general, it's just a terrible, terrible idea. I mean, I, I absolutely agree with that. And I think it's really interesting what you were saying about disabled people essentially being left with an ultimatum if that does happen, you know, around do I stay on this platform because it provides me with connection or do I do I decide to come off of it because of either the abuse or also, you know, the moral, I suppose, implication of staying on the platform because you know of other people who are be being, you know, faced with online abuse and that's not okay. And I think it's, it's a really difficult balance, as you say, because this is very different. But I personally, when the Cambridge Analytica scandal broke and, you know, it was talked about people's data being shared and influencing votes and all of that, I decided to personally come off Facebook because I didn't agree with what was being done on the platform. And I wrote about it, you know, saying I was a young disabled person who found a lot of personal value in being on Facebook, but I couldn't reconcile that with my feelings about how it was being run. And I've really thought a lot about how I'll feel about Twitter if you, you know, as you say, if and when that happens and particularly god help us if donald trump comes back on the platform you know as you know not only someone who extremely disagrees with them but you know as a you know american living in the uk how i'll feel about that presence being back online and what that will mean what that will say to other people using the platform and all of that it's a really big big decision and yeah i i just think that your analysis of that is so interesting and it'll be very interesting i suppose is one word to use it um to see what will happen then with the platform 
going forward. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I think you're you're right in that if if someone like Trump comes back, it will definitely embolden other people. Uh, you know, even even uh, just the fact that he would have returned would have encouraged other people to be as problematic as he is, to put it very politely. I, I don't know if swearing is allowed on your podcast, but there's certainly a few strong words I can use to describe that individual. <laughs> um, and also, you know, let's not forget Donald Trump has mocked disabled people. There's there's clips of him mocking a dis- disabled reporter. I think we've all seen that infamous yeah. clip. And do we really want more of that on the platform? Um, no, no, we really don't. Especially That's putting all of the other monstrous things that he's done aside. I don't think we really want to, um, to have someone like him on the platform. Because also, I, I think the other thing as well is I remember, um, and this, this isn't perhaps on the same scale as Trump being ableist himself, but people were being ableist in their in their kind of ha ha takedowns of Donald Trump. You know, you, you would hear about the comments about how he walks funny or how he drinks water funny or um, how he oh he might he might be wearing adult nappies or anything like that. You know, there's so much. Um, I remember there being so much ableism thrown at Trump to try and take him down. I, I, th- th- there's that risk as well. It isn't so much that, well, it is um, just a factor of mm. what Trump would say if he came back, but also what some of the people that would otherwise typically be left-leaning or be kind of um, more aware of the, of, uh, the uh, needs of disabled people and marginalised communities to just completely abandon that to, you know, use ableist rhetoric to shut down a, a former president. It's, yeah, it's it's very, very murky. And mm. uh, I, I can only hope that uh, Musk's current situation where he's saying that Twitter needs to show, I think, like less than 5% of the accounts being bots on the platform. Um, I can only hope that... Um, the information comes out that means that the deal is off and we can rely on um, we can rely on uh, Twitter not being owned by a massive Republican billionaire. God, when you phrase it that way, it sounds terrifying. It sounds like it should be a political thriller movie. But I, I do want to say to anyone listening to this or engaging with this content that if you haven't seen that clip that you mentioned, Liam, of Donald Trump doing a impression, if that's a word you want to call it, of a disabled reporter, please do look it up. Not that I want to give him more views, but because the people that I've informed that that happened quite often don't know that it did happen. They assume that Trump's hatred goes towards different minority groups and I it a hundred percent does, but he did come out the disabled community and that's not something that anyone should forget. So please do look that up if you haven't and um yeah just be be aware of that. But I think it's really interesting your you know analysis of what that present could mean and what it could signify to others on the platform and I, I really didn't think about other people using ableism against Trump and how that can then have an impact on us as you know left leaning or left what whatever we want to call it disabled people who share absolutely no views with Trump. Um, I think I can I can wholeheartedly say that. Um, so I think that that's very interesting and something to bear in mind as we see what happens with the platform um but uh, we've talked a lot about your you know your career and all of the campaigning and advocacy work that you do but I'm really interested to ask you what would you say you are the most proud of um wow um I think I think something that well I, I might say something well, I think I'm going to stick with something that has happened for now. But if you ask me again in a good couple of years or so, um, then that answer might change because I have a book coming out um, 
some point in the future and I think my answer will change to that when, when it's in in out in the world but right now I think the um the the kind of main one would have to be my reporting on where is the interpreter which for those who aren't aware um in at the very beginning of, of lockdown um and well right until right until the the daily briefings stopped um the, the Boris Johnson and the UK government's uh, press conferences on the coronavirus came without a British Sign Language interpreter, um, which is as ridiculous as it sounds. Um, there came a point eventually where they managed to um, nudge the BBC to provide it on the BBC News Channel. Um, but when you consider the fact that the BBC News Channel is kind of buried uh, on channel 601 or whatever it is uh on these uh on the sky and the virgin media and whatever compared to anyone else just being able to go on channel one and see boris johnson right there on bbc news uh it's 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 quite it's quite discriminatory and, and segregates deaf people out so i i kind of joined uh kind of followed that along quite early on um really trying to figure out what on earth was going on. Um, and it was it was just this ridiculous kind of back and forth between the uh, the BBC kind of indicating that, well, if if they want to do if we want to do more and if we want to have the interpreter available for uh, these briefings, then it's something the government should sort out. And then when you go to the government, they say actually it's something the BBC should be sorting out. So there was this constant back and forth and Kind of passing the buck around as it were um so i was trying to make sense of it all and um the reason that eventually came about so there was a few petitions and, and things calling for an interpreter to be provided uh including um including one petition that i think had well over uh well well over a good um good thousand signatures um that then warranted a government response um, and in their response, they basically said, oh, um, we're working within very confined, limited spaces in Downing Street, um, and it's not safe to have an interpreter in the room because the room is so small, COVID, social distancing, yada, yada, yada. Um, the funny thing about all of that, of course, is that we then had a press conference in the Rose Garden when Dominic Cummings gave his statement about um, his trip up to Durham and all of that nonsense that ensued um so the question then came okay well if Dominic Cummings can hold a press conference in the Rose Garden then why can't press conferences for Covid be held in the Rose Garden um and then obviously now what with the whole kind of party gate situation the question then becomes again oh okay well if 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 ministers are appearing on television saying oh Number 10 is such a big space. It's like, well, OK, you've just said it's a big space, but a few months back, or if not years back, your, your own government was saying, oh, it's actually quite a limited space and we can't have people in the same room because of social distancing. Mm. Um, one one um, Tory MP who was uh, the kind of chair of the Women and Equality Select Committee just basically said, I've been to Downing Street many, many a time. Um, I know the spaces that are available in there, just find a bigger room. And that, that it, it couldn't have been more succinct than that. Um, and so I was kind of following that along. There were some other, two other kind of major things as well. So the BBC wouldn't provide interpreters for the data briefings, which meant there were no sign language interpretations for the briefings from Chris Whitty, Jonathan Van Tam, um, all of the kind of scientific uh, advisors. Uh, and the second thing was that lawyers representing the deaf community that were beginning to prepare a legal case um, wanted to see a copy of the equality impact assessment uh, for the briefings, which to, to avoid becoming too legal basically is a document that is not obligatory, it's not compulsory, you can just do it. Um, but it's it's tend, it tends to be something that's worth doing uh, if you want to show that you as a public body have considered um, the impact of a policy decision or um, a measure on 
minority communities um, such as disabled people, uh, women, all of the other kind of protected characteristics that you would see under the Equality Act. Um, now, lawyers were told, oh, um, yeah, uh, this is by the government. The government told the lawyers representing the deaf community uh, or members of the deaf community, oh, um, we won't release this equality impacts assessment to you um, because it would be disproportionate to do so. It wouldn't be white. OK, so I use something called the Freedom of Information Act, which basically is a wonderful little thing that allows you to request inform information from public bodies and they have to give it to you minus a few except exemptions. Um, and I found that there was, I got a response back that said, well, we've tried to look for this information, um, but we can't find anything. So basically they were saying that it doesn't exist. Okay, so what you then have was government lawyers telling lawyers representing, well, namely the founder of Where Was the Interpreter, Lynn Stewart Taylor, who was brilliant, telling, those, telling that lawyer, oh, it would be disproportionate to release this document, which I then found out through the Freedom of Information Act doesn't exist. So that was that was ridiculous. And it eventually got to a judicial review um, where the judge found that for those scientific briefings where there was no provision whatsoever, the government did break UK equality law. Um, and what was quite nice in that ruling is in that judgment is that if you actually go and track it down, I actually have a little mention in that. So it's quite nice that there is a there is a legal precedent out there now that has uh, has my name in there. But also um, my reporting from that would go on uh, to win me an award in October last year. I won the Young Freelancer Award from the Association of Independent Publishers and the Self-Employed, which for short is IPSI. Um, and I, I, uh, I, I got an award from them for that work. And I said then, and I'll say it again now, that that wasn't or isn't my award. It's, it belongs to the deaf community because as, as, as a community as a whole, we were really kind of just nonstop talking about it and putting pressure on the government to do better. Um, and not least uh, led by Lynn Stewart Taylor. It was just the most incredible campaign, um, really drawing people's attention to it. And then also, also I thanked the Limping Chicken, which I mentioned earlier, uh, which was the platform that, um, that off, well, the, 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 the outlet that offered me a platform to write about it so regularly, um, Charlie Swinburne in particular. So, yeah, I'm just incredibly proud of that because it was kind of a, it was the mixture of getting recognised uh, and getting an award um, for that work, but also being part of a legal judgment, albeit in a very small way, that would go on to set quite a significant legal precedent. And that's just, you know, you always try and look for longevity in the work that you're doing and, and work that will hopefully outlive you so that there is something that um, kind of, that continues until the end of time when you're, when you're long gone. And the idea that there's now law of the land or kind of, uh, precedent, I should say, not law of the land, but precedent that features my name and will probably continue to feature my name for many centuries to come is, is a very nice feeling. And it's a very, very, uh, it, it certainly fills me with a lot of pride. I think, I mean, there's so many things in that, but I think it's so beautiful the way that you put that about the longevity and this sort of everlasting nature of it, because I think so many of us get into disability ac activism or advocacy because we don't want other disabled people to face the barriers that we did or to be in the same crappy situations that we did. So, you know, to, to really see the impact of that must be truly incredible. And I think it's it was one of those things for me that when I became aware of the campaign it was one of those things that I couldn't unsee but so every time I watched one of those briefings I was always thinking there's no interpreter here and you know that just really speaks to how effective your raising awareness of the issue was along with all of the other people that you mentioned but um it yeah it's just incredible to to be part of that I'm sure but I just want to say a huge thank you, Liam, for joining me on 
this podcast. I could I could ask you a million more questions, but I am aware that we've been going for a little while, but I found this absolutely fascinating. So thank you so, so much for joining me on The Wheelchair Activist. Thank you so much for having me. It's been such a wonderful conversation. So thank you so much for having me on. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of The Wheelchair Activist with Liam O'Dell. I certainly did not expect to jump into all things politics and Elon Musk in this episode, but I enjoyed it so, so much, and I hope you did too. Before you go, just want to remind you that we do have a GoFundMe and a Patreon set up for this podcast to make sure that we are practicing what we preach and achieving a high level of accessibility. This includes a fully captioned version of every episode on YouTube. If you are able to give this podcast a share, we would appreciate it so, so much so that everyone who is in your network can potentially benefit from these amazing conversations. Thank you again for joining us and I will see you in the next episode.